Well, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this is Doug Cogswell from Advisor Solutions. I'm your host, and uh, we'll be talking about levering your data to compete more effectively in higher education. And uh, we're going to go quickly through industry context and really get into why uh, using data to help make decisions is more important now than ever before, where data can be most useful. We're going to show some examples of how visual discovery analysis can help. And we'll run through uh, use cases and results and typical benefits uh, you might get. So again, I'm, I'm Doug Cogswell. I'm the uh, president and CEO of Advisor Solutions, and I'm joined today uh, by Jorge Escobar. Hey, Jorge. Hello, Doug. Jorge is the uh, vice president of campus ops at the National Hispanic University in uh, San Jose, California. Uh, it's a member of the Laureate International Universities, and he has a range of other experience, including Princeton and their advancement operations, and you can see down below uh, extensive work uh, in a variety of Office of Development, Internal Commission, and so forth. So we're pleased to welcome Jorge today. He's uh, an expert in really uh, how to use data in higher education, both on the advancement side and, more importantly, uh, today on the student and operations side. So, you know, the context here is across the board, there's increasing competition, new forms of competition, uh, changing student demographics, uh, more older students, uh, people coming back out of the workforce for retraining. Clearly, online education is having a major impact across the board, and people are trying to figure out what's the role of the classroom versus the online, the lecture versus class exercises and participation. And increasing globalization, especially combined with online education, which could be delivered from virtually anywhere. Uh, the market uh, or the industry, uh, to use that word, has changed substantially. And I actually think the pace of changes is accelerating. So it's a real time to really dig in and understand what's working, what's retaining your students, what's exciting your students, what's attracting your students, and using kind of that insight to target uh, your different approaches to uh, bringing in new students and then retaining them once they're there, obviously understanding what's the most effective use of the classroom or the online uh, education. Well, we, you know, we're, we come from a, we're advisors, a company that does data analytics. Uh, we work with all kinds of different data systems. We have an extensive practice in higher education. We also work in other, other industries. But you know, one of the things that's needed here to help make these decisions is better access to data. Higher education's data systems tend to be fragmented. They're probably customized more than we often see in other industries. And getting a handle on the rich trove of information that's in there is, is really important. And there are, you know, we have one, but there's a number of software tools and techniques that are available today to help you get the data out of the databases so you can work with it. Uh, the second thing we see that's needed is a culture of analytics and assessment. There's a lot of, you know, we do work in a lot of industries, and there's a lot of perspective here especially that we can farm this out to consultants or, you know, let's have somebody come in and score some data or prepare a report for us. The problem is the decisions need to be made by the university, and the insight and the understanding, we just, it's much more powerful if it's owned by the people on the team. And, at the end of the day, the analytics is not as hard as trying to understand the nuances and the context and what to actually do with the insights that come from the analytics. So we're big on helping teams get access to data, helping set up in-house cultures of analytics and assessment. And that leads to faster and more data-driven decision making, which in this changing world is really important. So, Jorge, I'm going to turn it over for you, to you for a few minutes to take that kind of high level and now let's take it down into the work you're actually doing uh, in uh, National Hispanic University. Excellent. Well, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everyone, for joining this webinar. Uh, for those of you who manage data or are responsible for operational aspects, reporting, compliance, our friends at the Department of Education, our accreditors, um, this presentation will provide you with very, very practical experiences. Here at the National Hispanic University, we are a very small uh, university. We have around uh, 800 students. Some of those are already online because we have started online uh, less than a year ago. But we are part of a larger uh, organization. 
Laureate International Universities has around 60 universities in 30 countries. So we are looking, I'm looking uh, at this uh, uh, initial pilot of data analysis with advisor as one way of moving the awareness of doing data reporting and analytics in a different way. And believe me that I have learned about data, data management from my old days at uh, Merrill Lynch when we did implement these big systems for data reporting, data warehouses, data hubs, and then SPSS came about, SAP, and all these type of complex systems. And I'm just, you know, going back in time and thinking how much more effective would I have been if I had a tool like Advisor where I can compile the data in very raw format and then visualize it and present it in a very professional way in a PowerPoint presentation for executive management. But in addition to that, I think you know the understanding of the data, visualizing it for decision making, and also to simplify or ask specific questions to the operational team during the life cycle, it's very, very critical. I also, you know, I have to be uh, honest with you, and I learned about Advisor when I was working for Princeton University uh, in the Office of Development, and I saw this presentation of this company, Advisor, um, at an Ivy League conference. And immediately, uh, that was like the aha moment where, you know, you see exactly what you need in a development office to see fundraising activity, donors, prospective donors, uh, table of needs, all that represented in a heat map. It was like, you know, a, a great moment of awareness. So since then, I've been following Advisor, and uh, now at the university, I've been able to start using that uh, for some very specific operational uh, aspects. If we can move to the next slide, uh, Doug, um, basically the student life cycle in a four-year or in a college um, is fairly the same. You have prospective students that eventually will get admitted into a process and then eventually will graduate. But as Doug said, you know, the dynamics of higher education are changing significantly. There's more competition. There's online. There's MOOCs. There's all these kinds of things that are driving the front end. So we have to be smarter about lead generation, paid search, uh, uh, search engine optimization, data about prospective students, and just getting that up and running before we even admit a student. It is very complex. And having that data analyzed, it's usually done by marketing and all these other functions. But I think understanding that data in a different way that makes the connection eventually to the student and then to the graduate is, is critical. So the students, once they get admitted, they move into basically a system, a system of knowledge transfer, learning, uh, where there's many actors and services. Any university goes through the same process, basically going, a student goes to class, registers for a class, goes to a faculty member, submits an assignment, you know, leaves campus live, and then the life continues for four years, uh, um, at least four years, and then eventually they will they, they will graduate. During the graduation process, um, and this far end of the process is becoming more and more um, important for institutions that are accredited, especially in the United States, because we are uh, depending of Title IV because there's more regulations, there's more compliance, there's more reporting, gainful employment, all these type of things. In addition to the employers that are looking for the best and, more, and, and best trained individuals coming out of the university. So both ends of the equation are becoming more significant that require more analytics, but also the whole understanding of the whole uh, life cycle. The core drivers of data in higher education, no surprise, is basically the faculty, the student, and the courses that makes those, the connection between those two. These uh, uh, leads into additional pieces of information and actors. Uh, the course that has all its own uh, pieces of data, a course code, a course reference code, a pseudo code, you know, all these things that is familiar um, to all of those uh, uh, that manage this type of data becomes, you know, in, you know, increasingly complex. 
Then you have the faculty. You need to understand who is a part-time, who is a contributing faculty, who is local, who is not, who is giving a lecture, who is an online professor, who is the department chair, how do you promote that supervision, what about tenure for human resources and all these other aspects. So the human resources element becomes a little more complicated. And obviously the students, the students that actually generate a lot of all these other activity. We want to know the demographics. We want to know what classes the students are taking. We want to understand the financial need of those students. We want to understand um, the uh, academic uh, performance. So it comes down to the student academic probation and all these other pieces of information that make those three simple actors is an ecosystem that is very complex and data driven. And obviously in the representation that you see, those little boxes I see as the fragmented spreadsheets, the download, and we end up living with those uh, as solutions. Unfortunately, when we look at those uh, reports, for the most part, those are very um, specific pieces of data and reports to manage a function. So if you look at admissions data, yep, they have a good understanding of the admissions part. Yes, the registrar has the records of uh, the students, but then, you know, making that connection to financial aid, making an understanding of who is admitted, where's the faculty, and how that course gets uh, optimized so we can have the best assignment of classes and optimization of the space and the faculty that are available, it becomes very fragmented. And I haven't seen one system that paints the whole picture from a start to finish that provides the linkage and that gives you that visual uh, perspective of the student life cycle. So no surprise, and I don't know whose representation is that. Is that uh, uh, Doug's or my, Mateo? Mateo, I think you're also on the line. That's a good picture of you. And that is a very... <laughs> when we first look at the data sets and start trying to work with them, our, our hair starts burning and stands on end. But believe me, that's the life of an operations manager. That's the life of uh, the person that is doing reporting. That's the life of uh, the person that is compiling the data to report for iPads. This is the life that we need to do for surveys. Yes, when you have to submit information about your school, about your operating expenses, about the number of faculty, full-time faculty, that's the face of many people uh, in higher education. And it's because it's data-driven, it's fragmented, and it's report-intensive. And the problem is that with the dynamics and the velocity of uh, this data, we basically have to start looking at better ways of working together. So um, what is needed? Yeah, 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 we need to collaborate. We need to help each other. We need to think holistically. But I think the only way of doing this thing is really if we bring together the data, understand it in a holistic manner, look at, that, look at the big picture, but also understand what are the implications down, uh, up and down the, the, the stream of processes and systems in a way that is very analytical. The problem, once again, is that the data is divided by all these departments and the different uh, teams. And there's no way of aggregating this data in a way that it's uh, uh, visually intensive, so the executives can quickly start asking the right questions um, about the, any, any stage of the organization and the students. So um, the, uh, that's the reality. So one of the things that I wanted to uh, share with you is uh, just to make the connection, because I'm sure that uh, the participants are feeling the same pain these are the usual data sets or data elements that you know we look at on a daily basis. At the start of a term, during midterm, at the end of the term, and here the cycle starts and continues on and on, right? You know, you're looking at the great distribution, the student academic uh, uh, probation, uh, trends. Are you moving the GPA up or down? What is triggering the student academic uh, uh, probation? Financial aid, the students moving from full-time to part-time? Are they, you know, uh, dropping classes? Is there any trend in the faculty? You know, who is performing on the faculty? Who is giving good grades, et cetera, et cetera? We have to go through this on an ongoing basis. And on the, on the far right, um, once again, 
alumni association. And here's also the connection to development offices or the advancement offices at many institutions where you actually have to rely on the data of the students or the alumni for fundraising efforts. So when you look at this whole thing, there's a lot of operational data that is uh, cultivated, maintained, reconciled on a daily basis. The next thing that I, you know, how we are trying to do, and um, I think uh, we do this one way or another, is basically thinking about these buckets of information. What is institutional data that is required to manage the organization? What program-specific data is required for analysis? How do we look at the students as a whole, faculty, financial pieces, and financial aid? And it's not unlikely that we'll get to a point where, you know, yes, universities will have to start managing dashboards. And I know that many institutions, you know, try to go through the whole process of, yes, we need to build a data warehouse, a huge repository. We have to uh, put, um, you know, big systems on top. And yes, Cognoscent is going to resolve the issue. Yes, yes, it can be done. Very expensive, very time consuming, and it's not flexible. So these are kind of uh, some of the data elements that I think should belong in, in a dashboard um, for executive management. That kind of has an overall picture uh, to make the connection and uh, obviously uh, understand what is that we're trying to resolve. But for these, I think you know we have been able to uh, use advisor uh, for very specific data management and executive reporting. How did we go about it? Um, we got our license uh, with advisor. Uh, there's uh, different types of licenses, but you know, uh, there's one that I uh, specifically I use as an analyst. Although I'm the vice president of operations, I, I like data, so I, I toy with that, you know, every day. And um, the first thing was because most of us have a good sense of the data structures. I collected a uh, complete data set of our students, faculty, and the courses. So all those elements at the kind of individual level. So right now, for my small university, probably I have 80,000 records of information when it comes down to counting each one of those grades by a student, by department, etc. And then with that download that I get from the core systems, I was able to structure it so I can refresh at any time. And then I have put advisor on top of it, everything is connected. Mateo, who is going to join us in this dialogue, has helped me tremendously to understand the logic behind my thinking to come up with very simple ways of looking at this dashboard in a solution that you will love. So Mateo, can we go to the next one, basically, which is um, uh, just comparing you know, in one page. You can see on the right-hand side the ugly data rich spreadsheet and on the left the representation of the same data so quickly you can start looking at okay what classes are in green what classes are in red and then you can drill down and say why is it the faculty is it the student is it the student ratio and getting into that level of conversation so let's uh, we'll kind of launch a demo um, a web version so gonna open up a browser and uh, bring up a disguised version of one of the projects that Mateo is joining us. Uh, Hi, everyone. Mateo and uh, Jorge worked on, and we'll let Mateo and Jorge kind of run through what you would do with this. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, uh, Mateo. Uh, by the way, Mateo is uh, probably 3,000 miles away from me, so we're going to try to run this as smoothly as possible. But uh, you can see that you know now we have been able to manage the integration uh, fairly easy. And it's as simple as it is, uh, as you saw. You click into the project, and voila, you know, the report comes up on the dashboard. Here you are seeing, um, at a very uh, quick glance, uh, you are seeing around 18,000 records of information represented, basically grades um, of a student. You can see the count on the right-hand side, and then immediately you see the representation of the grade distribution. Obviously, this is this guy's data, but uh, uh, and you have different ways of looking at your own grading. But these are the usual ranges, and you can see that um, there's a lot of A's and B's in this data set. 
And yes, you can get into how many withdrew, how many did an incomplete, how, you know, you can get into all those levels of details. But in addition to that, in one page, you can quickly see the grade distribution by term. So in an academic year, you can see a spring and you can see fall. And then you can see the average grade by department. All this information that can quickly um, get represented. Now, the beauty about this specific tab is that you can select on the A's, for instance, and immediately you filter all the other information out. So when you look at A's, you can quickly see if the A's are distributed by term, probably in an equal way. So that's guiding you into something, right? The same thing as the average grade by department. And then on the far right, on the top corner, you can see the actual uh, department, the grade, and the actual data behind it. So this is one tab um, uh, that shows uh, the information about 18,000 records all at once. And this information gets refreshed um, basically as soon as I get the, uh, the, the data set from the core systems gets updated and refreshed. If we go back and reselect the, uh, um, all the grades, uh, basically with a click of a button, you're filtering in and out data sets that are huge. The next uh, tab, um, we are looking at, a, at courses, course data. And what we created was a heat map, basically showing grades and average GPAs by department. So the numbers that you see, like 3,200 and 4,200, uh, it's a department number uh, that we have assigned. And you can quickly uh, look at the uh, greens, the orange, and the, and the red. And just for, you know, for this exercise, if we can just click on the, on, the, on the red ones, just click one, for instance, on the red. By clicking on that point, you're filtering all the other information out. So you can immediately get into what record, and you can see the student IDs. You can have the student names if you want um, immediately out there. So imagine the power of having something like this in front of a department chair or an academic advisor that needs to make an outreach to those students that are basically with a bad grade in a class. And you can see right. trends, right? Yeah, and since you have all the data connected, one of the things you can do is go back to this page and grab you know, these departments with the lowest grades and then get rid of everyone else. And you can come back here and see the distribution in this heat map just for those departments that we have. So you see you have some departments that are like the different courses have a similar distribution, more equal, but you can see, for example, these 9999 uh, department, there are some greens and then there are some reds that are bringing the average grade in the department down. So like you said, you can even go further down to a specific courses and now we drop from the whole data set to this specific area of focus. That's right. And um, so I think, uh, Mateo, what you're saying is that the data right behind the scenes is interconnected. So once you filter, all the tabs in this project get affected. So that's, that's cool because you're looking at all these tabs and you will see once we complete everyone that by selecting the A's or the B's or whatever else, you filter the information so you can see the, the information quickly updated. Uh, this will take a lot of manpower to do pivot tables, data downloads, perhaps an access database to uh, correlate some of the data, then try to represent these manually somehow in PowerPoint, and then you can go to the meeting and show off, right? Uh, but now you have it all at, all at once. So why don't we uh, look at the uh, course and professors, uh, Mateo, which is the next tab. For us, it's very important to understand uh, the instructors and how the instructors get tied to courses because, you know, instructors have a, a workload and a, a faculty pay structure that has to be monitored. So you can quickly see who are the top professors, what classes they are assigned. And here, you know, you can see the distribution with the, with the different colors, but you can also maximize that information and you can 
see the records at a more granular level. So you can immediately see the instructor name, and then you can see the grades basically that are represented with with it with the same color the same color scheme. And that ties, you know, in, in addition to giving you the information about the, the, the faculty and the courses that are making that uh, a great uh, uh, determination, you can see also value-added data, like the level of the student. So how many students are with A's in uh, upper, level, upper level or lower level division classes? And is this an online versus ground? So you can start comparing the modalities, how the performance of that is going. So all at once, the same information. On the right-hand side, you can see the actual student records, and uh, you can get down into actionable, actionable um, items so you can follow up directly with the faculty or the student. The next uh, uh, page that we created uh, basically looks at uh, uh, grades. You know, once again, you can do uh, many charts, different types, whatever you need to accommodate the, the way that you're used to doing the data. In my case, I like all these Pareto charts and um, uh, basically distributions because, you know, that's how I'm trained to uh, look at data. Uh, but uh, in this case, you can look immediately and we can maximize the data, uh, Mateo, as well, so we can look at the, the numbers um, at a more granular level. and. Uh, by, uh, by looking at the student records, so those uh, numbers is the way that uh, we created um, student data records, you can see that that student has, the top student has mainly A's and uh, probably I think one C. Once again, this data is not, that, it's not real. Um, so uh, you can see the charts being affected and, and, and represented and updated you know, uh, quickly. Right, and for example, we can see here a couple of students that seems to be having some problems. So you can, you know, even if that's not your main question in your query, you see that and you can just click and then see the, the student ID, you know, more information. And you can even get here the grades and the particular department. Exactly, exactly. And um, so these uh, these pages that were created as the dashboard that I want to see uh, refresh on a daily basis um, has other pieces of information like the current uh, students. I want to have a, a an immediate view of the current students page, and uh, you will be able to see here basically um, what degrees they are pursuing, the full time versus part time, the level. Uh, the counts, overall GPAs, you can craft any of these calculations. And uh, Mateo has been great because, you know, first of all, he understands the statistics and he is an expert in data and calculations because some of these things are just pieces of data in our reports. But then you can start adding some intelligence and logic behind so it gets represented in the best possible way for your reports. Right, and another interesting thing is that you can use color as an extra dimension to look into data in a different way. So in here we had the actual grade as our color. In here we're, since we're talking about students and not courses in this section, uh, we have the GPA for that student. So it's interesting to think of color as another way um, to make the analysis. That's right. So the next one, uh, the student educational background, is something that is uh, important for us. Uh, we are looking at where the student came from, what the high schools uh, they got recruited from, uh, when did they start with the university, can we compare uh, GPAs and SATs and do some correlation and see if there's any trends um, in the student academic performance. So we can do all this type of uh, analysis. Um, on the next uh, page, uh, uh, and so, sorry, I'm uh, moving fast, so I can leave a space for uh, questions. Um, here's another way of representing the biographical data. I'm interested in understanding specifically what zip code uh, those students came from, because that's where we just invested money in sending a uh, mailing or a campaign or an email distribution. So by doing that, you can immediately you start uh, looking at the data at your student 
and then making that connection that I mentioned before. It's not just about the process, it's not about the classes, but now you want to see if the students are coming from this high school and that's the high school that is, um, you know, giving us good grades, we want to start cultivating those relationships and understanding that as kind of an enrollment strategy as well. The next, uh, uh, I, and I think final one, it's uh, the grade list. So um, once you have all this filtering of the data, actually the system can produce another extract, which is the representation of the data that you're seeing. And now you can take it down once again, export it to Excel, do whatever you need to do, run additional statistics, or use this list to give it to your academic advisors or uh, enrollment advisors or faculty uh, members and say, you know, this is what I need you to do and drill down specifically on potential solutions and be proactive about the data management, but most importantly, guiding those students so they can persist and they can graduate and obtain good grades. Awesome. And I'm the, uh, I guess the timekeeper here. Uh, it was perfect right on time. Uh, so that was you know, a great example of one of a number of use cases in grading course analysis. Uh, there's a whole set of other, you know, things we obviously in half an hour aren't going to get to, but Jorge sort of teed this up ahead of time. Retention progression lends itself to this kind of uh, discussion. Uh, you know, what is the characteristics of the students who aren't staying in? Uh, let's identify those characteristics uh, in, in incoming students and maybe take preventive action ahead of time to make sure they stay in the program. Just saw a great example of grading course analysis on the uh, inbound side. Uh, all the uh, characteristics of successful admits, uh, targeting mailings and so forth, so you're most effective. All that kind of marketing stuff is really important. Uh, widening participation, diversity, uh, survey-based results. You know, this, we, we are great at helping uh, untangle uh, messages and surveys and relating it back against the grades. You know, part of the information in those surveys can be really helpful to understanding grade imbalances, uh, the kinds of things we just saw. Lastly, uh, financial performance, uh, financial-based metrics drilled down into outliers, causal factors. And Mateo just actually finished a project with a, uh, another uh, higher ed uh, U.S. university in that whole area, uh, where it's basically for the CFO and the operations team to you know, get that same kind of visual dashboard up in front, but then allow you know, people to uh, be able to slice and dice and work through it. So uh, I'm going to move into Q&A, but there is one question that came, and I want to I catch right now, which is what about predictive modeling and predictive analytics? So I'm going to jump into that for like three minutes and then come back to the general Q&A because I know that's a pretty hot topic. So um, Jorge, you uh, actually raised this question yesterday when we were talking about this. So I'm going to get out of my email, uh, bring up an advisor project, the same one we were looking at before in our client offering version, and just I'm going to build a model. So the question is maybe what are the characteristics of the students who are getting the Ds and Fs? So you could visually explore the data like Mateo and Jorge just did, or you can run a model. So let's run a model. I'm going to grab this. Uh, this is 1,126 students with 2431 grades. Let's go back a minute. I have you know, a total of 3195. It's actually a pretty good group of my students who are getting at least one bad grade. Uh, so when you work with our software, you load data, design pages, work with data, analyze data, build predictive models. So I click that, I get a panel, and I'm going through this because I just want to make it clear. It's really easy to do modeling. Uh, you don't need to be a stats expert. I click new model. I'm going to call it, you know, students with bad grades. That's what I just selected as my target. I'm going to, this is a, called the classification model. I want to understand what makes this group different than everything else. I can't forecast. It's not a number. So it's a group. So that's called the classification model. Here's all the possible explanatory fields. The numbers of grades might be a factor. I've got to take off the final grade because that's what I selected. I think as I looked at this beforehand, the number grade is the number version of the final grade. It's going to tell me that the number grade explains the number grade. That's not particularly useful information. And I know there's a bunch of SAT scores. I'm just going to take a couple out. You know, the modeling will figure out overlaps, but just make it simple. I click OK. So it's now building 25 or so regression-based models behind the scene. It's going to come back with the one that's the best fit. A couple more seconds here. And then uh, what it's telling me 
uh, telling me I, it thinks it has enough information to explain the target to people who got Ds and Fs. It's telling me it has enough information that if I give it new data, it can predict accurately. And it's telling me that the instructor explains 25% of the DNF. And in fact, if you get these instructors, this is a lift bucket, you're much more likely to get a DNF than if you get these instructors. Now, this obviously could be aligned with course. Uh, but there's some instructors who are more inclined to give these and F. High school GPA, uh, low GPA, 2 to 2 So these are the lift buckets. You can sort of see this makes sense. And then the higher GPAs, so high school courses. Uh, there's a set of courses like oh, these bio biology and math, more likely to get a DNF. Uh, there's some things like accounting and uh, some of these other courses are less likely. High school, 6%. You know, there's a few high schools that if you're in these high schools, you're more likely to have problems versus if you're in these high schools. High school graduating major. Uh, these majors are more likely to have problems than these majors. So this modeling here has given me some understanding of where I'm having problems and what the key factors of those problems are. I can click predict and predictable scores going back against all the students and putting scores in uh, predict, predicted in a score for likelihood of, of having uh, a, a bad grade. And it, it ranks them from you know, kind of high to low. And it puts it into two buckets. So one, the modeling thinks they have a likelihood of having the behavior and a zero don't have low likelihood. So I could then take this, uh, if I had maybe I built the model and then let a, a new group come in, new students come in, and I can score them based on the courses they're entering into. It's going to tell me I expect this group of students to potentially have a problem. Uh, export the list out of here. And um, let's get some maybe interaction going or mentoring or coaching with those students ahead of time. So that's, that's really how you know, a predict modeling can be used. And it really is pretty simple. Um, you need to have some sense, some sense of the data. You need to have some sense of you know, causal factors. But it's, you know, I think we've made the interface here simple enough. And this is back to this in-house culture of analytics where we really encourage the in-house teams, whether you use our tools or somebody else's tools, to do this kind of stuff in-house. It's faster. It's less expensive. You all know your data better than the outside consultants, and you end up with better decisions. And you can flip these things around quick. My point is modeling doesn't have to be this big, huge exercise that takes a long time and costs a lot of money. That was a good question. So uh, I'll drop out of this and back into uh, the Q&As here. Jorge, did you want to comment on that? Uh, let me just bring you back into the dialogue. Um, no, I think that was a, a great uh, explanation, and I think you know once you have a lot of data, getting into the next level of analysis, which is predictive modeling and understanding um, what are the key uh, variables affecting the decision or the outcome of uh, the student, I think it's fantastic and um, something that you know once you get more students and more data, you know trying to do uh, that unless you're um, a genius in statistics and understanding. In addition to that. Um, the uh, culture and the understanding of the student demographics and the faculty all at once, it will be very difficult for you to understand uh, and get down into actionable, actionable items. Uh, you know, for institutions of higher education, the Office of Institutional Research usually does a lot of analysis, but, you know, not necessarily uh, that gives a comprehensive view. And uh, this type of tool and access uh, actually makes the decision making and the analysis more democratic. So, you know, more people in operational teams can see these things, which uh, otherwise they would not see until, you know, it's too late because either time has passed or the students have failed. So, fantastic, uh, you know, addition, uh, Doug. So, Jorge, uh, a couple of more questions for you. These two go together. How hard and how costly was it to get the advisor project up and running? And then the second question is, how do you look at payback on it? What's been the benefits? Um, all right. So how hard? Uh, let me tell you that in the scale of uh, 0 to 10, as uh, you know, my doctor says, uh, this is a 2. Um, it, it was really yeah, I assume easy. that's the good end of the scale, but that 10 is where you're having a tooth taken out and it really hurts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a, 
uh, that uh, it was uh, it was uh, easy, uh, and I think it was easy because you know we did a lot of prep work because I was already heading into the direction of more analytics and the culture of assessment and getting uh, information that would allow me. Uh, from an operational perspective to see as packets of opportunity where we can improve the student experience. Um, but um, once you get the data, and you have the data, that's not a problem. Data is, you know, in abundance uh, at every institution. Once you understand your data, you basically have an extract, and then um, with the assistance of advisor, you basically tell them what is that you want, and they will help you craft the, the portfolio. Um, I don't know if I, you know, I can tell you just my experience about the uh, the pilot that we are doing. Um, it is not expensive. Um, it's not it's not expensive at all. And I think you know uh, one is because uh, the professional services that the advisor provides they are very um, they are very honest. They are not dancing around. And they are not billing you hours uh, for coming and just checking you out. Uh, they are actually doing development work. So I've worked directly with Mateo. We've connected. He understands what I'm uh, um, uh, asking him to do. Uh, so they immediately start delivering uh, value, um, you know, from from day one. So that's uh, I guess the answer to the first part of the question. Um, what else? Uh, and the return on investment. So because the investment is reasonable. I think the return on investment of man hours and you know eliminating some of the spreadsheets and uh, optimizing some of the reports that in itself it's a lot of uh, return on investment positive return but in addition to that I can see all those slides every single day without doing anything without doing any pivot table so just the visual representation of all my records at once at any given time it's something that anyone that manages data can dream of uh, the, um, and the other thing is, you know, once you have this information, you can distribute it. Uh, so you have other people that have the access. They, you can distribute the project. They can view it. Some other people can do the analytical part. And then you can also take it, put it in PowerPoint, and, you know, go to an executive meeting, you know, well prepared. Yeah, that's one of the things we didn't have time to show, but yeah, you could take those pages and just export them right out into PowerPoint, either the, the individual charts or the whole pages. Uh, so it's, we've made it pretty easy to get the results out into normal Office documents. Uh, and I think it was mentioned too that the lists you can export out into Excel. So if you want the list of you know 60 grades that are the issue, uh, just quick export out. It's in Excel. You can then you, you've got the subset you want. We also we've got, or hey, we've got some cool examples of, of clients where they'll also bring this into a board meeting or a senior management meeting and put it up on the over. I don't know if you do this. Comment if you do. It put it up on the overhead projector, and then the thing is, if somebody asks a question like, "Where are those D's and F's coming from?" Uh, great, it's these kinds of students. Or they're, they're aligned towards specific professors. The answers are right there, and it really makes the discussion come alive versus that cycle of pain problem we mentioned earlier where, you know, without that, somebody's okay, I've got the question, I've got to go back, cut the data, I'll come back in a week, but the board isn't meeting in a week, uh, so we'll send it out to them, but they forgot all about the question by then. So this drives, you know, where it's used in those meetings, a much more engaged, collaborative, fact-based discussion, and it's been pretty cool. Yeah, and that's correct. And, I, you know, I think that part of the benefits when you have a solution like this one that is, you know, changing basically from data to information, uh, you start also uh, adapting the, the culture of the people that are reviewing these things. So, uh, yes, you can set up a, you know, a student review committee once a month and go through this whole thing and analyze the information up and down and drill down and up. Um, so it, it changes the, the dynamics, it changes the culture, it makes everyone more aware, but also it gives you the additional perspective, you know, I have a student that has, uh, that came into the uh, uh, student academic performance list, okay, so, but now, what is, uh, who is that student? The student just came in, yeah, well, the student just got an F, and yes, the student, you know, I know that they started to work or they have a personal life situation that uh, forced them to move from a full-time uh, status to part-time. Well, all these factors are affecting this app, so now you have an explanation and then you can follow up. Uh, uh, directly with a student and come up with uh, alternatives as well. So there, there's a question about um, the 
whether there's a data mart and how this compares to a reporting system is essentially the question. Let me let me start with that, then Jorge, you can fill it. Uh, so what what we're doing is we're an in-memory data store with interactive visualization, which you saw. So we are a, a much we are a very light footprint front end. We we are loading data from you know, Banner, DataTel, all the different common sources. We're actually pulling it from Oracle or SQL Server, the databases we can load from Excel and Access, and we can mix and match data, but Instead of building a structured warehouse, uh, we're bringing the data in, usually daily, in relational table form. So uh, what you're seeing with those charts is they're connected to the data in memory. And every time you make a selection, we're recalculating everything across all the tables and then recharting it. So it gives us this ad hoc flexibility uh, sort of that's extreme. Um, a reporting solution is meant to get structured information out consistently every day in some you know, form. It's not meant to allow people to explore it. So there's actually two very different technologies. And we obviously can do reports, although you know, we're not pixel perfect, and we're not going to do grade reports or student invoices or that level of production reporting. And the reporting tools can kind of do what we do, but you've got to do a lot of database query and custom report creation. So that's sort of where we differ is uh, you know, we don't need this big structured data mark. We can load the source tables. Uh, if we have the structured data mart, it makes life easier, but certainly not necessary. And then we give you this really fast, we call it speed of thought uh, capability to just mine through the data. Uh, so it's actually quite a different underneath technology base uh, aimed at this. It's a whole field. Uh, the Gartner Group and the Forest or all the uh, tech industry analysts call it data discovery and analysis, which is perfect for the kind of example we just showed. Jorge, any uh, additions to that? No, I think uh, you know. Uh, I want to overemphasize the uh, the simplicity, but also the flexibility, um, because you just saw kind of the final product, uh, you know, in one display. But if you have the, the the training and you understand the tool, you can create your own calculations. You can do a lot of additional things if you are sought to explore additional aspects of your own data. So uh, it brings a lot of flexibility, but also the dynamics. And uh, you don't have also, you can also short circuit, you know, a lot of uh, technology requests and IT uh, support because there's nothing sophisticated like creating a data warehouse or a separate server instance of this type of thing. So it becomes very implementable for anyone in operations. Yeah, in that mode, we're kind of, we call it, we call it an analytic sandbox where, you know, you can combine courses and professors or a group different grades or link in uh, survey data that's in a totally different data set and you just do it in, a, in our app uh, which either runs on you know, Windows PCs or if you, want, you saw the web version which runs on iPads and browsers but it's uh, you can just flexibly do this really quick and if it makes sense like some of these metrics and calculations you might then want to put them in a database so that other systems can use it but if you're not sure, it's like that's a lot of work. In our world, it's easy to do it, and you can try things and visually see them and say, "I tried it." It actually it doesn't give me the distribution anything like I thought, and that was a, a, an idea, but it didn't pan out. Let's try it a different way. That's the kind of the world we're in. And uh, this data, you know, when you're analyzing and exploring it, uh, that's the kind of stuff you know teams are doing. But I'll also add, you know, we mentioned, I think Jorge mentioned earlier, we do a lot of work also on the advancement side. In fact, we actually do more work there than on the student side, which is a, a really good fit because it's a very dimensional data where you have all this information about the, you know, the alumni and the, uh, the prospects, parents and whatnot. And you're, that's an area where you're always trying to find patterns, um, find people who might be inclined to give to a certain cause. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a really a perfect storm of, of fairly complex, rich data with the ability to, to always see patterns and cut it different ways. So that, that's another story, uh, which we didn't cover today. But in higher education, we do a ton of work on that side of the uh, organizations as well. Other questions? There's a question about iPads and tablets. Um, so we, we run on iPads. Uh, we run in all forms of browsers, uh, Chrome, Safari, IE, Firefox, whatever. And um, our authoring uh, and power users run on Windows PCs, Windows XP, Vista 7 or 8, 32, 64-bit. 
Um, typically, in our world, um, hardcore analysts who are doing modeling and this whole analytic sandbox we've just been discussing would work on the PCs, and, and most of the people who are using it day to day who aren't like loading in new data and, and aren't going to be calculating the metrics, which is run it in a browser. And the, the demo we did was in a browser. Um, could equally been on an iPad with all the gesturing. And, you know, the iPad, we've got some cool stories of where uh, an institutional research or an advancement per professional will walk into a dean or a provost uh, with an iPad uh, with some data and a story and start a discussion and just, you know, by gesturing and tapping on the iPad can drill into the data and, and get the whole, uh, that whole discussion about, you know, answering the questions right there. Uh, it's a really, could be a powerful way to take the information out into uh, the organization in a very, very flexible, easy format. What else do we have? We answered all the questions. Yeah, that's pretty good. Well, hey, uh, it looks like we've actually cleared through the questions. Any any final comments to the group? Words of wisdom? Mm, um, I think uh, you should explore uh, uh, the, the tool. I think it's important that uh, you start looking into new ways of managing your own data. I'm sure that you know you're already in the, uh, in the midst of many projects. Uh, but with uh, 2014 coming around, I think this is the perfect time to start exploring, evaluating. And if you need more information, happy to help. Uh, I, I come from uh, this culture of higher education collaboration, uh, where I feel that the more that we share, the more that we help the students. And uh, that's actually the final outcome where we should care about. So I'm uh, happy to help. And if you have any questions, you have my contact information as well. Yeah, so yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Jorge and also Mateo for their time today. Yeah, both of uh, mine and Jorge's contact information are on the screen. You know, we love these conversations. You know, feel free to email us. If you've got our phone number, give us a ring, and uh, we can go deeper or, you know, connect you with other institutions uh, that are peer-like and uh, wrestling with these same challenges and trying to you know, create insights and use data to make better fact-based decisions in this changing environment. So Jorge, thanks, thanks so much for the time today. Really appreciate it. I love what you're doing, and uh, thank you for uh, a very articulate presentation. My pleasure, Doug. Anytime. And thank all of you for joining us. This has been recorded, and we'll have it up and posted within the week. Uh, thank you very much.